Hello friends, um, I hope you're, you were as encouraged as I was by Sunday um, this week. It was so lovely to have both congregations together for, for the 10am service and to reflect on God's work this year at the APCM. Uh, and then we topped it off with 13 confirmations in the evening. Um, it was a very happy day. Uh, the only downside to having the confirmation on the Sunday evening service was that we missed um, chapter two of Jonah. And at first glance at, at, at chapter two, I thought this was a, a very strange chapter indeed, and that um, perhaps it wasn't such a bad one to miss, um, but that was very foolish of me. Uh, as I've been thinking about that chapter in preparation for a Bible study this week, um, I've been increasingly blown away by what this chapter shows of God's incredible mercy. Um, so in the first chapter of Jonah, uh, Jonah is disobedient and proud. Uh, and actually, there's, there's no evidence at all of him having um, any relationship with God. He, he doesn't pray once through chapter one. And at the very end of chapter one, we see God um, saving Jonah, sort of, uh, as Jonah is thrown in, into the sea and God sends a big fish to swallow him. And I say God sort of saves Jonah because... Although he's kept from drowning, Jonah is trapped in a fish's stomach um, for three days and three nights. Um, not a happy place to be. And actually, Jonah's misery in the fish is very clearly expressed um, through lots of his words in chapter two. In verse five, he says, the engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed has wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountain, I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. Jonah is left utterly helpless. He's at rock bottom. Uh, but actually, this dark, stinking prison, it's a rescue from God in, in more ways than one. So not, not only has God kept Jonah from physically drowning, but he's also brought Jonah to such a state of misery and helplessness and humility that at long last, Jonah does what he hasn't yet done. Verse 2, in my distress, I called to the Lord. Jonah cries out to God. He prays. At last, he looks to God and he trusts God and he begins to depend on him, partaking in relationship with him. Isn't this kind of God? It's, it's almost as if God is saying, look, Jonah, I love you too much to let you carry on thinking that you don't need me. So I will bring you down and humble you enough that you will turn to me. So wonderfully, as Jonah turns to God, as his relationship with God is restored, even though he's still in the belly of the fish, he begins to rejoice. In verse nine, he says, but I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. Now, it is not true that every instance of suffering that we go through um, will definitely have come to us for the same reason that this suffering comes to Jonah. That's not true. But it might well be true that the Lord in his kindness could be using our suffering to, to bring us to the very end of our own resources, to leave us helpless so that we only have one place to turn, to him. Because if we have a relationship with God where we depend daily on him, if we're looking to him in our pain, then even at rock bottom, we have reason to rejoice. So will we come to God today and express to him just how much we need him? Because whether it's a happy day or a sad day, whether we're in joy or sorrow, we do need him every day.